Amen. It's been a great week for me, spending three or four days with some wonderful men and women of God. How many know everybody needs fellowship? We all need fellowship. That's so important, how important it is for us to be involved in a belong group so that you can have fellowship because elbow, rubbing elbows with the right people, a great spirit is stirred in your heart and the fire of God is rekindled constantly as we connect one with another. How many know God never intended for us to live this Christian walk separately and independently of other people? Thank you for your enthusiasm. He never intended for us to live it separately. That's why if you're separated today, it's difficult. That's why you must make a, make a, a, a purposeful, intentional choice to be involved in the house of God. Because that's where the life flow is. That's where the blood flows. John said it like this. He said, as we fellowship one with another, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all unrighteousness. I believe that when we're gathered together, the filth of the world is, is falling off of us as we gather together. You know, I, I'm learning over and over, and I'm not trying to be doctrinally, you know, controversial. But, I, you know, as a, as, a, as a kid growing up, you know, I, I was always believed that salvation was a one-time event, like, like, like baptism. And I'm learning more that I have to be saved over and over every day. How many have learned that? You have to, you have to, re, you know, I understand I enter into the kingdom of God, but I have to continuous, continuously uh, experience the blood of Jesus. I have to continuously stay under the fountain of the blood of the Lord. And that's why it's so important as we talk about the altar, how important it is for us to remain at the altar. Because when I'm at that altar, I'm literally saved from this world, saved from hell, saved from situations in my life. It's a place of sanctification, amen? So let's open the Bible this morning. I want to continue talking about the altar. There's no sense of going on anything differently until we've mastered where we are. In Genesis chapter 8, um, I want us to, to look at a, a familiar verse that we're, we are uh, we, we're understanding of, of course, this is the story of Noah and the ark. Of course, I want to continue talking about the altar, but the altar of sacrifice, okay? So Genesis 8, verse 20, and I want to look at verse 20 and 21. Now, this is what the word of the Lord says. It says that Noah built an altar. Say it with me. He built an altar. That was weak today. Say it again. He built an altar. He built an altar to the Lord. See, he built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. He offered God something on the altar. Now let's go on. And the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. I mean, oh, our praises can be smelt in heaven. Our praises, our prayers, the Bible says our prayers are like what? Incense. Incense. They're like, they come before the nostrils of God. There's nothing like smell that brings you back to a remembrance, right? You remember when you smell something. I mean, you ever, you ever uh, smelled, um, I don't know, some of your old clothes? I don't know. You, you know, man, some of us have, I don't have a bad body odor. You know, when I sweat, I, sw I sweat perfume, all right? But, <laughs> but, you know, you go back and you smell an old piece of clothing, it's can almost it takes you back, or you smell, you go back to your, your mother's home after she passed away, not to stir up any negative emotions this morning, but you go back and you can smell certain things, or you, you come in contact, you go, man, I remember, I smelled that. You know, what's, the, what's the one that makes us go back even the best? When we smell some food. It brings us back there, right? Come on, somebody, y'all from New Orleans. Hey, Amen. I ain't talking to people know about food. Everywhere we go, if we're somewhere, it's like, we're from the ones, oh, I got some good food over there. Yeah. <laughs> That's all they always tell me. It's like, you know, we got great people too. Yeah. Y'all got some food over there, boy. That gumbo. Yeah. So it's a good place to be where, you know, we, we got some good culture and good food. But the, the point I'm making is this, that there was aroma. Aroma went before the Lord. Now you understand, I, just, I want you to read this today as we talk about the altar of sacrifice. I'm going to continue talking about it and teaching Last Sunday, 11 o'clock, those of you who weren't with us, 
I think God answered us by fire. I wanted to preach, but we couldn't preach. Those of you who missed the 11 o'clock service, you missed the best service of your life. I'm sorry. I'm sorry if you had to go home so early. I'm sorry because you have obligations. But we had fun here. When God answers by fire, you see, I think God was speaking to us and he was, he was, he was performing and demonstrating for us all of the word that we've been talking about and what we're putting into action. Because really we want God to answer by fire. Now, we see here in this particular verse, this is after Noah comes off the ark. Now, Noah's been on the ark for over a year, right? It rained 40 days and 40 nights. He's been stuck with a bunch of animals all this time. Eight people are saved, and out of all the millions of people that were on the planet at this time, only eight survived. And we know that Noah was the one responsible. <laughs> the man only had one sermon. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. It's going to rain. And people didn't know what to hear. See, see, here's the problem. When we talk about God's going to do something, it's almost like I'm like Noah sometimes. I feel like I'm looking at the crowd and the crowd don't get it. I'm saying to the crowd, it's going to rain. And no one's making preparations. I'm telling you, we're living in a season where God said, let it rain. I haven't been here this week. Has it been raining here in New Orleans this week? Don't curse the rain. Let it rain. Because as the natural rain comes, so is the spiritual rain. How many want the rain of God in your life? Amen. So don't curse the rain. When you're riding across town, say, man, it's rain, rain. I can't, I can't drive in rain. Well, ask God to help you. Learn how to navigate through rain, because if you learn how to drive in rain, maybe you'll learn how to drive in the spirit through the rain. But what here is so important today, what I wanted to share with you, and it just kind of sets the foundation of what I want to continue talking about, and what we've been talking about for a couple of weeks, is that the first thing Noah did, listen to me now, after one year, after one year of living on a boat, he gets off the boat, he could have done a number of things. He could have tried to build a house. He'd been living in the ark. But no, the first thing Noah does, the Bible records that Noah builds an ark. I mean, an altar. He builds an altar and he takes and he brings the sacrifice. All right? These sacrifices were clean animals. They weren't the unclean. It was the unclean animals that came two by two. You can go back and read it. We have it, you know, so, so, but, but there was many, many different kinds of animals on this. And these clean animals were, had been set apart for one year waiting to be sacrificed when Noah was off the ark without an altar. And here's the promise that God gives. It wasn't until after, you can read the rest of those verses in verse 22 and verse 23, when God smells this sacrifice that goes up, because you have to understand now, these were sacrifices because there were no other animals to reproduce from them. These were special animals that I believe that Noah had set aside for himself. And so here's the sacrifice. The sacrifice is God, Noah doesn't know how God is going to reproduce so that he can continue the sacrifice. But all he knows is that if I'm going to start this new journey out, this new, this new genesis, that I need to first, somebody say first, build an altar to God. And so what does he do? He lays those animals, splits them, blood is splattered on the altar, and God smells it, and then God answers Noah, and he says to him that I will never, listen to me, I will never destroy man again as I did. I truly believe it was because of the sacrifice at the altar. Now, God didn't say he wasn't going to spare cities. He just said the whole world. I've always argued with God. I said, God, why do you, you said you weren't going to do this again. He said, I didn't say the water wasn't going to come. I just said I wasn't going to let water circle the entire earth and wipe all of mankind out. But I truly believe because of one man's obedience, one man's obedience to the altar and understanding the importance of the altar as he laid down his sacrifice, 
an aroma went up to God, and once again, God says, I have confidence in man that even though their imagination is always evil and turning against me, I will never curse the earth again for man's sake, and I will not destroy it. I truly believe today, listen to me, City Church, if you have ears to hear, Issachar ears to hear, eyes to see that what you're doing by building an altar is a matter of saving not only you, your family, your relatives, your neighbors, but an entire city, possibly even a region, or could we say even a nation, that God could even save this nation because of your obedience, somebody, to the altar of God. How many do understand today the importance of the altar? So I want to review this real quickly. Everyone needs an altar. Say it out loud. Everyone needs an altar. But here's the kicker. Everyone needs to build their altar. It's time if you want to grow up to stop living at somebody else's altar, grandma's altar, mama's altar, dad's altar, your aunt, whoever. It's time that you build your altar. What is the altar? Again, let me just refresh you. The altar is the place where sacrifices are made to God. I've got this this uh, altar out here, and I've been building it, okay? I've been building it. So today, I, I don't want to unbuild it to rebuild. It's going to remain built. Why? Because as I get to the end today, as I finish this leg of the sermon, it is a responsibility not only to build it, but to remain there constantly at the altar. If you're going to maintain what God has given you, if you're going to remain in the same place of fire, and passion in your life that you've had over your period of journey with God. It's important that you remain right here at the altar every day. We've talked about the place where God and man meet every day. How important it is for us to understand that it's a place where we can talk to God, that we can lay down our burdens and we can share our life with the Lord. It's a place of revelation. It's a place of realization that we need to change. How many know that this whole Christian journey is not about us changing other people, but it's about God changing us, not from the outside in, but from the inside out? I was a part of a church, the Pentecostal church, and I thank God for my Pentecostal roots, but everything was about don't do this, don't do that. It was all the outward things. Don't cut your hair, girls. Don't put makeup on. Thank God for makeup. Even an old barn needs Makeup. Come on, somebody. Nothing to get. I'm not calling you ladies a barn. Y'all are beautiful. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is go ahead and wear your makeup. But I, 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 I came out of a church where you couldn't wear makeup. You couldn't wear jewelry because they would call you a Jezebel. My Lord. I knew people who didn't, you know, who, who, who had no jewelry on, but their tongue was longer than this altar. What God is trying to do, right, is change us from the inside. From the inside out, because true change is what is what has God. You know, in the Old Testament, you know, grace grace is no less than the law. Remember that now. In the law, you could look at a woman, but you just couldn't touch her. In grace, you can't even look at her. Somebody says, "Oh, I love the grace period." No, you don't. You'd rather live under the law because you just at least look and not touch. Now you can't even look. So stop trying to get out of it. Realization of change comes when we stay at that altar. But if you remain, if, if you remain away from the altar, that old man will come back to rule. The old man will try to overpower what God has done in you. So it's a place where you're sanctified. When you're in trouble, when you're in need, when you are going through difficult times, that's the place that you need to run to the altar. Run to the place where you meet with God, where you're, placed, where you're sanctified. Sons and daughters are depend upon the, the altar. Number four, you find the altar when you are in crisis. I know I found the altar when I'm in crisis. I know I found the altar when I am in, uh, in need greater than when I'm going through some fun times. So in the New Testament, now we know the Old Testament, as I read the Old Testament, that was, that was Noah. Noah built an, built an altar and he sacrificed. But thank God today, we don't have to bring those blood sacrifices because we know that Jesus already paid the price with his blood. 
So he took his blood and went into the throne room of heaven on the altar that's in heaven and he laid his blood on that altar so that now there is no there's no separation between us and God we can go to God at any time because the blood of Jesus is there however because today we are not in the Old Testament we are in the New Testament under the New Covenant there are still sacrifices that God wants us to bring. And uh, let me show you the sacrifice in Hebrews 11, verse 6. And I'm reviewing, and I don't want you, I know you kind of get, I want you to get bored, but I want you to understand how important the altar is because it's leading up to something very, very special for you and for everyone. Hebrews 11, 6 says, By, Without faith, it's impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. How do we know God rewards his people? All right? He rewards us. And when we seek him, we bring the sacrifices. When we bring sacrifices, the word of God tells us that God will reward us with something unique and something that is of a blessing into our life. So we seek the Lord and we bring the sacrifice. So the altar is a place where we bring sacrifices. No kind of sacrifices. We talked about it right here. We bring the sacrifice of prayer. We bring the sacrifice of praise. This is my makeshift altar, if you would. I want to give you a visual, but this is the altar of God. We bring prayer every time that we talk with God. We speak to the Lord. We're bringing a sacrifice. It's a sacrifice of prayer, a sacrifice of praise of worship when you come into the house of God on a, a nine o'clock on a Sunday morning I know I know sometimes you don't feel like doing it and you don't feel like lifting your hands and you certainly don't feel like dancing but guess what you're gonna have to bring a sacrifice sacrifice means death you don't you feel like you're dead you feel like four o'clock in the morning you feel like you don't want to do it but that's when you do it anyway because when you bring that kind of sacrifice to God, he does what? He rewards you. Come on now. He rewards you. So you're saying, Pastor, on the scale of feeling good today, I feel a one. Oh, that's a good sacrifice. On a scale of ten, it's easy to jump up and down. That's eh, a little sacrifice. But when you're feeling like a negative one or a negative five and you still get it up, you still say, Lord, if it had not been for you, where would I be this morning? When you praise him and you look down the aisle and nobody on your aisle is praising him and you say, well, I can be just like him. You say, no, I'm not. I got something to praise God for. Well, hallelujah, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to praise my row into heaven. Somebody give him some praise this morning. Hallelujah. Certainly when you're the only one praising on your aisle and you're making people miserable on your aisle, when's the last time you made somebody crazy in church because of your praise? Because if you can't praise God here, don't tell me you're praising him in your closet. If you can't get it up at the game, you can't get it going on at practice. Somebody said, I hate practicing. I do too. But I like game time. And if you can't get excited about game time, when you have other spectators and other people participating in this worship experience, then what's happening when you're trying to build your own altar? You ought to come in here every Sunday at 9 o'clock, whether you feel good or not, whether you got some bad news or some good news, and you say to yourself, today, I'm going to thank God because where was I when he found me? Where would I be today? Honestly, really, I know it's cliche, but where would you be right now if Jesus hadn't really plucked you out of where you were and set your feet on solid ground? You've got enough to praise God for a thousand years. Somebody, somebody ought to step up on their feet and give God a sacrifice of Praise! 
Come on, somebody. Look at somebody, tell them praise. It's the door. It's the door. It's the door. Can't you just feel as we've been building this altar that your prayers are just a little more intensified? You know why? Because God begins to add fire to it. And when he adds fire to it, it's your passion first, but he adds his passion to it. And when those two come together, the synergy of you and God together, we can rock the world. Literally rock the world for the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the Issachar initiative. This is what God is saying to us. I realize, as I said in the conference this week, I know what I'm doing. I'm rebuilding the altar of our church fathers from the first and second and third century. As I begin to look back at the early church fathers, not just the book of Acts, but even those in the second century, the third century, the fourth century, I realized that every time God wanted to bring a movement, he established, reestablished the altar. Now, the thing about my altar, if you're looking for some big words, you're not going to get it because I can't use big words. I'm not that smart. What I do is I try to make the complex simple as possible because if it's not simple, I can't understand it. So maybe you can call me simple. Whatever you want to say, it's got to be simple. I like to live by the old word, the, the, keep it simple, stupid. Right? But the characteristics of the altar, listen to me just real quickly. The altar was made to bring sacrifice. If you don't have a sacrifice, it's not acceptable to God. See, bring the sacrifice that's acceptable to God. You see, sometimes we think, oh, we had church today. Well, was God accepting? Was, was God pleased with it? Did we sing the song like God wanted us to sing the song? You know, sometimes, sometimes you can come up here, even musicians and, and, and leaders and, and your, relative, your, your respective and your family, and you feel like, man, everything's going good. It may be going good according to this culture, but is it acceptable unto God? Because sometimes when things are not going in the right direction, it's actually bringing a sacrifice to God when you still praise God through those tears. So listen. The, the altar was made to bring sacrifice. It's a place where something dies that something else might live. When you come to the altar, something has to die. The first thing that usually dies is your will. And don't tell me that you don't struggle with your will. I remember as a, as a, as a, as a, as a young pastor hearing a pastor say, you know, I, 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 the problem with me is that uh, I, I keep putting my body on the altar, but I, 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 I keep taking it off. And I thought, that's strange. I got saved. What's he talking about? Did this pastor get saved? I thought it was a one-time experience. No, getting saved is every day. Every day. Every day I renew my strength. Every day his mercies, right? The Word of God says his mercies. Why would, you, why would David pin that, his mercies new every day, if he didn't need it every day? But my point is today is that the place we call the altar is a place where we bring sacrifices. Something must die that God may resurrect something. So every time you die at the altar, you're giving life to something brand new in your future. Are you getting this today? It's simple, but it's, 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 simple, but it's, it's, it's important. Because every time that you die at the altar, it gives way for God to bring something alive. God cannot resurrect something that needs to be resurrected in your life until you're willing to lay something down and die at the altar. Are you listening today? Thirdly, the sacrifice, as I've said, it must be acceptable and pleasing to God. The dimension of your blessing always begins with the level of your sacrifice. Somebody wants the glory, but they don't want to go, what is that said? To the story. They want the gain, but they want no pain. They want the prosperity, but they don't want to sow the seed. They want the blessing, but they don't want to submit 
to the Father and his plan and his will. They want God to stamp his approval on them, but they don't want to do it his way. This is not Elvis or Paul Anka. You can't have it your way. This is not even Burger King. You can't have it your way. This is the kingdom of God. It's his way or no way. I know we've been preaching the gospel that there's a lot of other ways to God, but there's only one way. It's his will. You're either doing his will or you're not doing his will. You're either in his will or you're not in his will. Come on, somebody. It's his way. Seasons begin to shift when you're ready to make some new sacrifices. Some of us are living where we are today on the sacrifices that we made in previous seasons in our lives. We're living at a level now where we sowed three to four or five years ago. So don't be discouraged if you're, if you're anting up on your level of sacrifice. Come on, if you're, if, you're, if, you're, if you're living at the, you know, if you're still sacrificing, if you're still serving in the church the same way you serve, you say, well, well, pastor, you know, I've got a job, I know you're full time. No, no, everybody's got something to do and God, it's not, you, everybody's, everybody's assignment is different. But your level of willingness to God, I'm going to talk about it next week, it, it comes to a point where, where, where you, 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 you leave just prayer and praise and fasting, your body, your mercy, and you're giving offerings until you get to a place where God won't leave you alone. If you're really living at the altar, God will never leave you just letting you pay tithe. If you're really living at the altar, he'll say, you need to give 5%. You go, okay, God. And you, no, now you need to give 10% beyond your tithe. And you go, oh, Lord, that's, that's a sacrifice. And he keeps on priding you until what? He gets all of it. God has a problem. He thinks he's God. He keeps. Why? Because the ultimate sacrifice is when you're willing to give of yourself. Now, that's a deeper subject. We'll talk about that next week. We'll explore that. Sometimes it takes you 40 years. Sometimes it takes less than that, but it takes a process. What I'm trying to say is that you're living in a season right now of the level that you have sowed. And I'm not just talking about money or your finances. I'm talking about your prayers. The levels of your prayers, the levels of your worship has increased. If you're not a greater worshiper now than you were five years ago, you need to go back to the altar and say, God, don't help me to sing my worship song better. Help me to become a worshiper. We got one of the greatest singers of all time passed away last week, right? Nobody, nobody can sing like Aretha. But thank God for great talent. But I'm not talking about singing a song that pleases an audience. I'm talking about singing a song and singing a tune or singing a worship unto the Heavenly Father that's acceptable unto Him. That is a rare, that's a rare gift in the world. Everybody wants to sing for the applause of man. But how many people want to sing for the applause of God? Can you have them both, Pastor? I've been trying to work that out for a long time. I don't think so. Because I've always seen those who try to live in both worlds, this world seems to pull them back a little bit. Now, can you be in the world, not of the world? Well, you got to know what you got to do. But my point I'm trying to, today is that our number one responsibility, if I'm living at the altar, and God can trust me to send me to places which you're going to have to really live at the altar. I'm just talking today. I'm not really preaching at you. I'm talking at you. So how many want to shift your season today? Come on, look at them. How many want to shift your season? How many want to remain where you are? Okay, you're going to have to, you're going to, have to turn it up. You're going to have to turn up the worship. You're going to have to come in with your roar, screaming in the parking lot. Freak the parking lot people out a little bit. Let them think there's an incident going on. 
And when they come over and say, what's wrong with you? You said, I ain't nothing wrong with me. I'm just getting my praise on. What's wrong with you? Where's your praise? Where's your praise? Instead of coming here, oh, Jesus. Coming here, I got a feeling everything is going to be all right. I like that. This is how I fight my battle. This is how I fight my battle. How are you fighting your battle? Trying to talk to the right person? No, the right person is when you start talking to Jesus. Come on, somebody. Come on, give God some praise in this house. How many want to shift your season? Raise it up a little bit. Raise your praise. Raise your prayer time. When we call prayer on Friday, skip the game. Yeah, because it's a sacrifice, see? I like to go out to the game. I ain't saying it's a sacrifice. Like if I got tickets and I got to give them tickets up. I'm, I'm not saying, I'm, I'm, look, I'm not saying that you don't need to go. I like football. It's been a tough summer. I love to play baseball. I even like basketball, but it ain't got football. So I'm, I've been sacrificing to get to football season, right? But what I'm saying is, is that whenever you got to give up something to get to the altar, God watches. He says, ah, I see. They used to not come on Friday night, but now they come on Friday. Ah, I'm going to reward them. Because he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. When you, when you push the plate back, and you're not pushing the plate back because you're trying to lose six inches. But you're pushing the plate back because you want to get closer to the Lord. You want to you know him. And you're not doing this because you're trying to coerce God. You're, you're, you're doing it because why? Because you love him. You love him and you, when you love somebody and you love the Lord, you are willing to do whatever you can for him. But understand that it's the sacrifice that brings a shift in our lives. Look at nine, Luke 9, verse 23. I know we've gone over these things, but it, this is so important that we just continue to hear this and we'll, 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 we'll jump up to something. Luke 9, verse 23 says this, if anyone desires to come after me. Come on. Anybody want to go after the Lord today? How about those online? You're watching us say, you want to go after the Lord? You want to go after him? Look what he says here in the rest of this verse. Let him deny himself. Let him deny himself and take up his cross, what? daily and follow me for whoever desires to save his life that word save means to keep your life as it is but those who were willing to what lose it whoever loses his life for my sake will what save it so the new testament blood sacrifice is that we don't have to bring bulls and goats and animals that's been done once and for all, right? But the blood is still our currency. The blood is still our currency. So in the New Testament, in the New Testament, we don't have to bring a bull. We don't have to bring a goat to sacrifice to God. However, there's still the offering of sacrifices that we bring. And those sacrifices, those spiritual sacrifices, as we see up here, are praise, prayer, fast in your body, offerings, mercy, yourself, there is still blood involved. You don't have to go cut yourself and sprinkle it on the altar. I don't, you don't have to go and, 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 and slice your, your neck and sprinkle blood to get forgiveness. No, we don't have to do that. But when we bring something to God, like our tithe or our offerings or our prayer, there is what I call a, a blood sweat equity. It's an equity that is, it, that is a sacrifice on our part. That as we sacrifice our time to pray, as we sacrifice our time to, to, to fast, as we sacrifice ourselves, this is a connection where we now deny ourselves, following God. And as we sacrifice this in the New Testament, God answers us by rekindling the fire that he has placed in our heart when we first got saved. So every time... You bring something that costs you something. Somebody say cost. 
See, your sweat equity, your blood is your currency. So when you bring something to God that cost you something, it's got to cost you something. You can do things out of obligation and obedience, and that's fine. But if it doesn't really hurt you a little bit, when we were building this church, it hurt to come out to work till 1 o'clock in the morning. But we were what? Sacrificing. And as we sacrificed, God helped us build this building back for $750,000 When the world told me you need at least $2 million to get this thing back up. I don't care what you say. And I said, I understand that. But all I got is two fish and five loaves. But if God will bless it, if God blesses my little, it ain't how little or how big it is. What matters does it cost you? You're not getting it today. Come on. It's got to cost you something. It's got to cost you something. Listen, nobody has a degree. It costs you something, right? To get that degree. And that hard one is that bachelor's. Woo! It costs you, right? What did it cost you? It costs you some nights not going out and drinking while everybody else was partying. It's the same way in the kingdom of God. When everybody else is running around, but you push the plate back. And you say, Lord, I need you more than anything. I've been through so much hell and back, I ain't got time for all this stuff anymore. I need you to come through. Come through, God. You got to come through. Answer my prayer by fire. Oh, somebody give him praise today. Hey, thanks for watching the City Church YouTube channel. If you've enjoyed this message, take a moment and click the subscribe button. That way you won't miss another message. If you've been blessed in any way by this ministry and you want to partner with us in taking the gospel of Jesus Christ around the globe, you can click the link in the description below to give now. Again, thanks for watching and don't forget to subscribe.